Um, hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Red Bench. This is our first event of the season. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really happy to be back. I am Abby. I'm the director here at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Tonight, I'm joined by Dan Egan and Eric Wilbur, the authors of 30 Years in a White Haze. But before I hand this over to them, I have a few announcements and requests. Um, this series is complimentary. However, it's our hope that if you're able to make a donation, you will. Last season, we had a few thousand viewers tune in, which is amazing. Out of those 3,000 viewers, only 11 and a half made a donation. If all or even half of those viewers donated only $10, that would provide the museum with the financial stability that we dream about. And just like last year, everyone that donates at least $10 will be entered into a raffle for a pair of darn tough socks, and each additional amount donated in increments of $10 will earn you an extra entry. The museum is a nonprofit organization, and we do rely on your generosity. So thank you to those of you that have already donated, and thank you in advance to those of you that make a donation tonight. Also helping support this series are our Red Bench series sponsors. I'd like to welcome our new silver sponsor, RK Miles, our returning bronze sponsor, Sisler Builders, and our returning media sponsor, Vermont Ski and Ride. Without their support, we absolutely couldn't sustain these events, so thank you. Okay, so joining us tonight, as I said, is extreme skier and author Dan Egan and co-author Eric Wilbur. Dan is a world-renowned skier and pioneer of extreme sports. He's appeared in 13 Warren Miller ski films and is known for skiing the most remote regions of the world with his brother, John. In 2001, Powder Magazine named Dan one of the most influential skiers of our time. And in 2016, he was inducted into the US Skiing and Snowboarding Hall of Fame. Dan's also no stranger to Vermont, starting his ski career in Sugarbush, jumping his first real cliff at Mad River, and he and his brother started their advanced ski clinics at Bolton Valley, eventually expanding to Jay Peak. Eric has spent the better part of the last two decades immersed in the New England snow and sports scenes. His skiing and travel work have appeared in the Boston Globe, New England Ski Journal, and the Boston Metro. His role as a sports columnist for Boston.com continues today. Eric is the editor of the New England Ski Journal, a high school journalism teacher, and co-author of 30 Years in a White Haze with Dan. I also want to mention that we have signed copies of Dan and Eric's book available in our online shop and in our museum gift shop. Quantities are limited at this point, so I would recommend making that purchase soon. If you would like to purchase online, but pick it up in our shop to save on shipping, you can use code PICKUP at checkout and it'll be available for pickup during open hours starting tomorrow. And uh, I will put the link to our shop and our donation form um, in the chat in a moment here. Okay, we will be taking audience questions at the end. So please type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many of those um, as we're able to. Okay, with that, Dan and Eric, I hand this over to you. Thanks, Abby. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. It's uh, so fun to be here and uh, really super excited to do this. Um, you know, September is that month where you're the furthest away from snow and the closest uh, to snow. It's like that, that a lot of anticipation uh, in September, and I call it the busiest month in the ski industry. There's so much going on. Um, and we made it through summer, so super excited. Eric, how are you doing today? Doing great. It's, uh, you know, back to school, kids are back, and it's um, chaos. But, you know, it, I love the fact that the weather is chilling down, um, and that is the first sign. It's like in a few weeks, we'll get those, those photos of Sunday River blasting the guns, you know, and just getting us all excited. Absolutely, and it's so fun to see all the skiers who are attending tonight, uh, I love that. I love the attitude in Vermont um, and just how hardy it is. You know, um, of course, we're East Coasters, and uh, I think that that just quals qualifies us for so much because uh, most East Coasters, myself, uh, Eric, and my brother, and everybody that I know, we ski in anything uh, all the time uh, just because we love it. And um, that's what 30 Years in a White Haze is all about. It's, uh, it's about loving to ski and the story of John and Dan and how we, how we went from Boston to around the world. The other piece of 30 Years in a White Haze, uh, it talks about the uh, Mount Elbrus expedition in 1990, uh, where John and I went to one of the seven summits of the world and I was lost in a storm for over 30 hours. Uh, 15 people died and a Russian saved my life at 
17,000 feet. And the next day, Sasha and I rescued 14 people. We had never told that story uh, really in its entirety. Um, so that's woven through the book. Uh, before we get going tonight, Eric and I want to show you just a little bit of a video. It's a short video uh, that gives you the overview of the book. So we'll, sh we'll go with that now. The book has all the stories in it, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it, it, the ups and the downs. You know, what I say early in the book is that skiing uh, saved me and almost killed me. I've dedicated my whole life to the sport, uh, and I've ridden that roller coaster going in all directions. And right around the time uh, Brother John and I were being inducted into the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame, Eric Wilbur had reached out to me. Um, you know, he's a great writer and had written about John and I quite a bit. Like he'd already had the the framework for White Haze already in place. Um, was just kind of looking for a direction. But when I sat down and talked with Dan that first day, I realized this was going to be a much more uh, a deeper uh, look at a skier uh, and, and at an industry that uh, made him a star. You know, I had seen John become a ski bum and slowly make his way into the films. I, I started Ski Bumming in 1984-85 uh, and did that for a bunch of winters in a row. And, and I wasn't really interested in skiing professionally. It hadn't entered my mind. I was interested in skiing and skiing every day. Once our career started to roll, it, 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 was, uh, it was going fast. Like it took off uh, into the movies, skiing for the North Face, skiing for Warren Miller. Warren was rocket fuel for my life. Uh, being in the movies opened up all sorts of doors. People seem to love being able to connect with a certain part of history that I think a lot of people really hold dear. You know, the stars of the 80s, you know, the Egan Brothers, the Delorier, Scott Schmidt, um, you know, all these guys that we saw on VHS film. We welcome these stars into our living rooms, uh, our dorm rooms, our, you know, ski houses. Uh, being able to put that into words and having that uh, sort of like a, a, a litany of that era uh, was very important and very special for me to do. The first time I met Warren, he told me that my skis could be like a jet airliner, that if I just held on to them, they'd take me all around the world. And, and, and he was right. Warren also told me that there was no book written on where you had to work and where you had to live. He told me to write the book. You could go anywhere. And he was right. It was you know, fascinating to talk to Dan and, and sitting listening to him for hours, uh, all the stories that he had from his upbringing to the adventures he had around the world, um, to the people he's met. Uh, some of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had. Having known Dan for probably 30 years, the book filled in a lot of gaps that I didn't know about him. He's a fascinating character. Uh, when you look at how entrepreneurial he is and has been over the years, uh, no matter how much you think you know about him, the whole story isn't there until you read the book. Yeah, so I don't know. I get jazzed about skiing just when I see that. And um, I, I, you know, whenever I see any of the old films, it brings me right back to to the time and the place and the people I was with and the snow of the day. When I see the tram jump or the cornice break, I remember the emotions of the day. And and Eric, what was that like for you? You know, you know, pulling those emotions out of me and putting that down in, in the book. You know, I, I've said this before, the first time we sat down, um, I, I didn't really know what to expect in terms of what this project might look like, uh, but I kind of envisioned it as just like, not as deep as we got, you know what I mean? Like we sat down and that day was more about um, the, the ties to their family, the, the Elbrus expedition, um, you know, your, your problems that you've had in life. And going into that on the surface was like, oh, my God, this book is going to be so much more different than I thought. Um, and realizing all those emotions and getting those out of you uh, was for me to be able to do that is, is a pride I have, you know, because I, I knew in the writing process that there were times when I would send you a certain segment and then I wouldn't hear from you for a week. And 
I remember in the very beginning, I was like, oh God, that's because he hates it. This is over. I got to find another partner to work with. And um, no, I learned quickly that what it was, was, was you were diving into it emotionally and realizing um, kind of the, the, the emotions it was taking for you to tell the story. And credit to you for, you know, sticking with that all the way through that um, you didn't hold back. And I think that when we decided to, to write this in the third person and not first person, um, you know, that, you know, that was done by accident, really. It was just kind of like I started that way. But I think in the end, it ended up really working because it allowed everybody else to speak their piece, to speak their mind without you um, running the show so to say. So while you are the author of the book, you're also taking a, a, a seat back, you know, to, to see what other people are saying about the industry, about you, about um, your, your legacy on skiing itself. And I thought that worked out tremendously well. Yeah, that, that was quite a process to, to do and to tell the story in the third person. And, and, and I'm so glad that we did because it gave, it gives all the different characters in the book, their, their say and their space to say it and, and their recollection of memories. You know, that's one of the reasons why I really always wanted to write a book because it, you know, it takes so many people for things to happen. And the book goes back into the days of the ski market uh, when my oldest brother, Bobby, after he got out of Norwich University, uh, ran the Braintree ski market for close to 10 years. And and working there and getting to meet all the reps that came through the ski market for all those clinics, uh, learning about the ski industry as a teenager, mounting skis, selling skis, uh, realizing how they were made. Um, Mike Bisner, of course, was a big part of that. Um, when I Once I got my driver's license, he gave me 16 windsurfers and I became the ski market uh, you know, windsurfer instructor and, uh, you know, all those sort of things, but all those pieces made our careers possible. And, um, when people, after they read the book, they always tell me, wow, I remembered all those names. I knew this person I knew, I didn't know, you know, that guy and all that sort of thing. Uh, how did you keep track of all the characters, Eric, in the book? <laughs> how did I, yeah. um, you know, I, I think it was, um, I made a point to try and do things in terms of segments. So um, I would concentrate on one segment for a month, right? And I wouldn't really pay attention to anything else. So if this month is about the business of skiing, then I talk to Mike Bisner and, and those people, right? If it's about family the next month, I'm only about your family and I'm not concerned about other things. Uh, just because, you know, you're right. The, the characters can get completely thrown all over the place. Now, towards the end of the writing, we were deep in COVID. So it was basically, my phone was ringing every five minutes because everyone was suddenly available. Right. Um, so at that point, then you kind of got to take, a, take a, a left turn and say, okay, we got to do what we got to do. Um, but, you know, the characters, and this goes back to, to, to sports writing somewhat and my anxiety and intimidation sometimes in that realm is that when you write about a specific sport, uh, the athlete is inevitably gonna come to you and say, what do you know? You're not playing the game. And to me, I felt like that at times because I've been a skier all my life, but at the same time, I haven't been in the business of skiing, right? And I haven't uh, uh, written about the history of skiing for uh, as uh, to the extent that I did. And so I was a little intimidated by that. And I'm glad that I had you at my disposal, obviously to say, this is wrong. Um, but when I've got guys like, you know, um, the, a ski shop owner who came up to me in the, in the middle of the summer and said, you know, that portion of the ski market and the, the business then was really good. And I had forgotten about this part and I'd forgotten about this part. And he was asking you questions about it. Um, that to me was a big boost because it felt like, yeah, I did it right. You know, I, I, I talked about and wrote about an industry that I hope I'm learning about more um, to the degree where someone in that industry comes over and says, you know, it was well done for lack of a better term. So, um, you know, and then there are other characters in the book that I wish I, you know, could have caught um, that, um, you know, we had the contact info. I think Moit was one of them that I wish you know, that we had a phone number from Moit. Um, but, you know, it, it was great to being able to, you know, I think when I 
when I first started this book, I think it was going to be the, the, the Dan and John show, which it is, but it's also, and I think that we don't get too bogged down in it. It is a ski history book, you know, that goes into, um, you know, a period of skiing that really hasn't been covered that much. You know, freestyle skiing has been covered in, in its multiple ways, but I think the extreme scene, um, at least for my generation was something that we watched and appreciated and devoured, you know, but never really had a chronicle of it. You know, there, there's ski magazine, there's skiing, but there's never really been a book about it, I think, in that regard. Um, so to be able to do that and put that together uh, for me is a really special moment. Yeah. And that, that's one of the really cool parts of the book is that, uh, you know, for me, it was really important uh, to tell that side of the story because uh, a lot of you will have remembered the movie Steep, um, you know. You know, where they trace, exclude Steep uh, by saying that Chamin that the, uh, uh, Alaska uh, is the Chamonix of, of North America. And that always rubbed me, you know, that, that movie kind of, I never sat well with me because I really don't think we, our roots came from the European Alpinists. I think, and we talk about this in the book, that our roots come from the free doggers of the 70s. Um, and like all things in America, you know, we were influenced by the Euros. but we, we emptied so much a sport as it was entertainment. Um, and I, I think that's spot on, you know, the history tied to the freestyle movement uh, and how it rolls into the extreme skiing. And that is complemented and echoed by the birth of the VHS and the VCR. And, um, and so, you know, we make that connection because that was the biggest technological revolution Uh, of our and that history, Eric, I think is what is what really brings the fullness uh, together. Yeah, I mean, you you've had your you and I have discussed steep in the past, and um, I I've I've watched it and never really felt one way or the other about it. You know, it's it's a pretty good movie, um, it's very good movie. But I think that you had brought up some some criticisms of it, and I was like, well, I don't quite get it. I, <laughs> I did just recently read uh, The Edge of Never, though. And right. that really gives you an inside look, obviously, into how it was made, that movie. Um, but mm -hmm. how that movie is nothing like it was meant to be in the first place, right? Um, okay. So I think that's interesting when you, when you look at it from that regard and you get uh, someone who wants to tell a story. And all of a sudden, this story becomes something completely other than that because, you know, other people get involved. In our case, you know, I think that the fact that we had control over the story and were able to tell it the way we wanted to tell it, you know, whether that be fighting people about, you know, the first person, third person narrative, or it be, you know, um, you know, telling certain things that, you know, in a certain way that I wasn't sure about it, but you were certain about it, you know, and having those discussions uh, was great that we were able to, you know, have that freedom, uh, freedom found to, to steal, to steal a term. And, um, you know, the history I think is, is, is I'm a history geek when it, when it comes to sports. So to be able to, to dive into, um, you know, something that I'm so passionate about and, and, and get a fuller understanding of a lot of the, the marketing and, and business side of a whole generation of, um, of the sport um, was really a treat. And, you know, the, the, the piece really, you know, John and I, uh, you know, we did not grow up in the mountains. We weren't a North Country family. We didn't grow up part of a ski team. Uh, we didn't belong to a certain ski area. We didn't have season passes. You know, we were ski club kids. We, my mom got a day off every Saturday in the winter by putting every kid on the Blizzard ski club bus that would pick up along 128 outside of Boston. And, uh, but our skiing roots go back to my grandfather who lived in the highest hill uh, in Boston, in West Roxbury. Uh, and my mom uh, learning to ski with her brothers 
down the medium strip of the parkway. Um, and then my dad, you know, walking four miles after school in his leather boots to ski and uh, in Quincy at the golf course, President's Golf Course. So, you know, we we had sort of like that route of skiing, but it really wasn't until John moved to Sugarbush in 1976 that, boom, things really started to happen. Um, and Eric, what, when you wrote uh, about my first uh, winter there, working at for Robert Ferenza at the Alpen Inn, uh, those stories, they're quite the ski bum story, don't you think? Oh, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Like that, I remember that day we sat down and you'd be telling the story and it was like, it was, I didn't know what to expect more or less than that story because it was typical ski bum, right? Um, Dan walks into the, into the, the well, I'll, I'll read a quick passage actually. The warning sign that Dan was stepping into an atypical lifestyle came shortly after he pulled up to the Alpen Inn where the owner, Robert Forenza, had told him his friend John, had, had told his friend John he'd hook up his younger brother with a dishwashing job. Forenza, whose family moved to the area when Sugarbush opened in 1958, when Robert was three, points to a chalet at the rear of the property. Dan would be living there with a roommate named Tom, named Tom, but he doesn't like to be called Tom, Forenza warned. Call him Gary. Gary. Dan met Gary, quote unquote, as he stepped into the chalet. There was a thumping sound growing louder and louder as he approached the front door. Upon inspection, he discovered the noise came from a man standing in the middle of the room throwing a knife at the wall. Kating, kating. Like Dan even had to ask, are you Gary? Forenza told Dan he shouldn't be fooled by Gary's rough exterior into thinking he was an ex-convict. That was hardly the case, especially because he was an escaped convict from Florida. He carries a knife in his back pocket, Forenza told him, except for when he was systematically throwing it into the wall, of course. He also had Dobermans and uh, his, his solution for fixing a a uh, clogged drain in the shower was to punch a hole in it so the water just dripped down and it seems outrageous but i think if you've been in that ski bum uh environment you probably met someone like that along the way and so to, to have that guy uh be at the forefront as like this caricature but not a caricature a real person uh was just kind of like you know his blast off into the kind of stories that dan could tell yeah that 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 was an amazing season of course and uh Later that season, I bought a one-way People Express plane ticket for $75 out for my first trip out west and uh, would thumb back from Tahoe all the way through all the ski areas through Utah and Colorado. And that was my first real foray into the ski bum lifestyle. Um, you know, Eric, we also really unpack Elbrus and um, and... You know, the thing, Elbrus was really emotional for me. You know, there's so many, so much part parts of that uh, tragedy that I really never spoke of for, for 30 years. Um, and and here we, we lay it out. We, we weave that story throughout the whole book. Um, in 1990, John and I were invited to ski the seven, one, you know, Mount Elbrus, one of the seven summits of the world. We were sponsored by the Degree 7 Company, which was owned by Patrick Valensant. And Patrick Valensant is the godfather of extreme skiing and was John's hero. John had met Patrick in 1986 while filming for Warren Miller over in Chamonix. Um, and so we were there. It was supposed to celebrate Patrick's life, who had passed about a year prior to the trip. And uh, it was supposed to be the coming together of the Chamonix extremists and the U.S. extremists. The trip went horribly wrong. Some people had one a chance to go on the trip. There were nine different country countries represented on the trip. Uh, but of the day on the summit uh, attempt, there was a big storm, uh, which in which I was lost for 38 hours. Um, but Eric, that story, you know, it just it's it's a typical mountain experience, right? Um, but also it has all these different twists in it. Yeah, again, the first time we sat down and you laid that story out for me and it became clear that this was, you know, a, an emotional period for you. I mean, why wouldn't it be? Um, and, you know, sitting down and finally getting to the, the meat of that story um, and having you tell me, uh, you know, 
bit by bit, you know, how it went and what went down and the, the, uh, the tragedy that you went through um, and the emotions you went through and how you fought through it and what it meant for you after that trip, um, you know, obviously became the meat of the book. Uh, but it was in our first meeting, you know, at, when we were starting to plan this, that I realized that that was going to be the overarching thing, theme um, because of, um, number one, the, the impact it had on your life. Number two, because you hadn't really talked about it or written about it before. Um, and also because it was uh, a shared experience you had with John. So getting yours and John's both sides of the story was, um, you know, tremendous. And, and I remember I got hours and hours and hours of, of audio from both you and John talking about that day. And it was, um, you know, it was fascinating to, to learn about um, something that I didn't know about, you know, that's number one. Um, and two, that it, it was this really defining moment and it, and it was almost uh, cathartic for you to speak about it in that way and to, to go back and relive it and to, you know, realize even though it's 30 years ago, what an impact it still had on your, your life, your, your beliefs, your career, you know, you name it. And so um, that's something I didn't know in the previous, you know, what are we talking, four or five years that we had known each other. Um, you know, back then it was like John, the Don, John and Dan show and, and all the crazy things they've done. Um, and they're from Boston. How cool. Right. And now, you know, you, you go and you realize like the, the Boston roots are so much deeper than just that. Um, and there's such a deeper um, emotional tag to the to the story itself um, than I initially thought, which I, and I initially thought there was going to be an emotional tag to it, but uh, nothing like this. So. You know, the, the Elbrus uh, piece, you know, I, it's great because I can envision it in my mind um, by the stories you told me. And that was great because it allowed me to write a lot easier that I could envision in my mind, which um, is credence to you as a storyteller yourself, the way you were able to kind of describe events and people and places and sounds and feelings. Um, so, yeah, it, it really does, you know, make up the bulk of the center of the book. Uh, for good reason, because it's a it's a fascinating tale of survival. Yeah, you know, anytime I'd ever mentioned uh, Elbrus to people, they would say, "Oh, you've got to write about it." Um, and you know, I had never a lot of mountain disaster stories, um, you know, end with with the epic rescue or getting off of the mountain. And I had, for me, you know, I was twenty six when that happened, so for me, it was the beginning of my adult life. And, and I never wanted to tell it as the ending. For me, it was the beginning. And that's why really all these, time, all these years later, I think it's appropriate to uh, start. You know, people have asked me, when, how long did it take to write the book? And, uh, you know, um, I, I had, I was at one point for Warren Miller Entertainment, I was running uh, 21 of the cities uh, for the fall tour. And I was running, you know, east of Chicago, basically. I was in charge of all the shows and um, all the PR and marketing for those shows. And um, one summer, they had the intern call me up and tell me they were taking the account in-house. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You're taking this account in-house. And, uh, and then I started thinking, you know, well, they had long since fired Warren. You know, uh, Warren had been gone for years, decades, and uh, there was only a handful at best of people who were still with the company who knew Warren. And um, a after I hung up the phone that day, I thought to myself, what would Warren Miller do now? You know, and I thought Warren would write a book, uh, you know, Wine, Woman and Warren, uh, lurching from one disaster to another, all those great Warren Miller titles. And that's when I wrote uh, down White Haze and, um, and started to outline the book. Eric had called me up, uh, I think it was just before the Hall of Fame induction in Stowe or maybe right after. Um, and I was like, oh, no, I got this, you know, no problem. I'm writing a book and uh, I'm all good. And shortly afterwards, I realized, boy, I don't know how am I going to get this across the finish line. Um, and I was, I was just so glad that, that you said, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot and get together. Um, you know, and, and there's just, you know, 
the way we tell it tied in with the history, the family, uh, Mount Elbrus. Um, but then there's all sorts of other things, like when I was the uh, general manager of Tenney Mountain uh, in New Hampshire. And, and that, that episode, Eric, is really quite funny. And it was a very stressful time in my life as well. Yeah, I mean, funny and stressful. I think those are two great adjectives for it. Um, back to the how long it took to write the book. Right. I did just get a, I, I got a text message recently from our good friend, Adam Chapman, who's right. a DJ uh, in Boston. And he just wanted to congratulate me on the book and, and thought it was great. And he said, but I think your biggest uh, accomplishment is that you got Dan Egan to sit down for more than 10 minutes and you got to interview him <laughs> all this time. Like, how did you do it? Uh, and I said, well, well, Adam, it did take two years. I mean, so it's how I did. But, you know, Dan's, Dan's uh, in Montana. He's in New Hampshire. He's in France. He, he's all over the place. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, bless COVID, because COVID came and, and grounded a lot of us and you know we were stuck in our homes and and it was the 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 thing we needed to get through the, the finish line uh, and, and putting this book out um yeah tenny is is tenny was one of the most enjoyable chapters that i wrote with dan because it is just it's wacky you know it's it's here's dan egan um you know movie star and vhs vhs extraordinaire person all of a sudden he's running a ski area like this little tiny skier in the middle of New Hampshire and he's trying to revive it and he's got all these great ideas and he's able to get some of them to work you know um you know he's able to, he's he's running through um a, a tough time in his marriage and the next thing you know he's making snow on the 4th of July and it was a, a great success you know it worked for a day or two it was a great success and the the fact that he was able to put his mind to something like that and actually get it done and reading about how he did it it's it's pure dan egan just the 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 fortuitousness of it no we're gonna do it we're gonna do it we're gonna do it and it doesn't happen overnight but he does it and it, it is a, a, a comical um kind of look at that but also you can you can feel the stress just emanating off his, his skin uh, there's one point where he meets moit um who he spoke about before and what was moit's uh just like a moit was our basically our uh you know jet he was the sort of ran the shop he was our yeah. maintenance guy yeah. yeah and so so you know moit uh pronounces himalayas himalayas uh told dan it would be better if he had a little more knowledge when he took this job you know, and it's that kind of character that, you know, I wish I could have spoken to if, if Moit's around. If Moit's on this call, then give me a ring. Um, you know, those characters really came out in the book. And, and um, you know, at, look, as a storyteller, I'm only, I can only be as good and I can only tell as good a story as the subjects tell me. And in that regard, I was lucky because I had so many people uh, with, with rich history that were were willing to tell their story. And, you know, in, in many cases, itching to get that kind of story out. So, um, you know, when you, when you told the Teddy story and, and, you know, there were other people that, you know, you didn't think were going to speak to me and they ended up, you know, being some of the best, better interviews in the book. Um, that, you know, from a storyteller perspective, um, really means something. You know, I, I, what I teach my kids in, in journalism class is that, um, you know, after 25 years in this business, I still remember the best stories I told or the most uh, engaging people that I, I met and were able to speak with. Now, 99.9% .9 of them are not baseball players. I'll tell you that right now. Most of them are skiers um, or hockey players because I don't know, maybe it's the winter mentality that, that all we all possess um, that, that gives us that special vibe. Um, you know, we, we kind of get each other in, in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, speaking and getting those kinds of stories out uh, was a whole lot of fun for me. You know, there, uh, of course, the whole Warren Miller piece was really quite something. You know, I don't think a lot of people realize how long John has skied for Warren Miller. You know, John skied in his first movie in 1979 at Sugarbush. Um, I, I was 13, 14 years old. Um, he skied again in 80, he skied again in 82, 86. Uh, and then we skied together in 80, 80, 85, 86. And then we skied together uh, for Warren in 88. And then as the Egan brothers, it began. 
And, and a lot of people have so many questions about how, what's it like to ski for Warren? What, what was that experience like and all that sort of thing. And, um, you know, really it, it's quite something to, you know, these days, you know, people are making on their phones, they're making videos, you know, they're making, it's, it's crazy GoPro and all that sort of stuff. But back then we we're still shooting, you know, film, uh, cameramen had to unload and load their camera in dark bags. Uh, so they had to do it by feel with their hands in the bag. They had to take their gloves off on, on Arctic trips and European trips with wind blowing in Elbrus, Tom Day with in the middle of storms. Um, and it was really a, an amazing process to do that. Um, when I finally met Warren face to face, um, you know, he asked me, you know, what sort of contribution did I want to bring to the movies? And I said, well, Warren, I'd like to go all around the world wherever CNN is and go to these worldwide events. And Warren loved that. You know, we tell the story in the book about how we were living in France uh, and we had, you know, seven people stuffed into a studio apartment. It was coming up to the British holidays and we were getting kicked out of the apartment. So we borrowed a van and drove to the Berlin Wall and jumped off of it. And, you know, to see people's reactions of skiers on the wall uh, and, and the impact those skiers and that film had, we did that for the North Face, was really impactful. The next year we were in Russia uh, during Perestroika. The next year we were skiing with the Kurds on the border of Turkey during the first uh, Iraq war. Uh, then we went to Yugoslavia before the civil war. We then went to Romania after they murdered Ceausescu and, and on and on it started to go. And it was so amazing because while we were showing these films, we started uh, with slideshows. Um, and I, Ned Gillette was, you know, somebody I had looked up to and admired. And I used to really be enthralled with his slideshows on Everest and circumventing Everest and all the different adventures he had. He was sort of the marquee guy for selling sponsorships to big trips. I had looked up to him. So we started with slideshows. And it would always happen in the theater somewhere or at a ski shop showing a show or a movie. Somebody would come up to me and say, have you ever considered skiing? Or did you know you could ski? And you know those sort of leading uh, comments is how we ended up in these places, uh, just on a suggestion. Um, and, and that, you know, for John and I, that travel piece is where we really connected with Warren Miller and the Warren Miller audience, you know? Um, for me, being in, in college uh, in, the, in the early 80s, uh, the idea of attaching myself to something bigger than me uh, was always something that, you know, we were taught in marketing and the business classes. Uh, so I knew Warren Miller had an audience bigger than I could ever reach. And I knew that the worldwide events would have bring a bigger audience to the Warren Miller films. Uh, and, you know, you don't really know you're doing it in the time. You just kind of, yeah, we can go there. Yeah, we can go there. But now in hindsight, you know, the impact that had on our career was amazing. And uh, I don't know, Eric, it, it, sometimes when I tell people the places I went and all the different places we went, they're like, come on, it's not possible. <laughs> you know, like, you know. It's, it's funny. I mean, it's, it's on film. So it, it, right. there's proof for you. Um, yeah. Speaking of, I, I, I say to my class and there are, you know, 14, 15 year olds, I say film and tape and they all look at me like, what, what are you talking about? And it's like, it's just, those are just terms. Okay. Deal with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, skiing the world and, and skiing where CNN was gonna, is going to go um, was at that point, in, in time, like just this foreign concept, right? Because uh, it was more about telling the story rather than just the, 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 the visuals. And the visuals ended up being fantastic because here's Dan and John climbing up a mountain and there's, oh, there's a, a helicopter right there in, in the way. Um, you know, in those sorts of things were so different at that point um, that, you know, I'm sure you know, putting words in his mouth that Warren really appreciated and, 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 and loved the, the new vibe and the new direction that you and, and John took it. Um, you know, it, it's amazing when, you know, my kids ask me, where have you skied? And I will, I will list it down or I'll show them the map in the book. And they just kind of shake their head like, oh my God, like, really? Like they have skiing in Turkey? 
Uh, and it's like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> he was there and I guess it, he told me that he did it. So why not? Um, but, you know, hearing those stories and, and hearing those foreign lands of, you know, for me and, and, and I have three kids that, you know, I took to Utah and that for them is like the big, the big adventure. Um, so for them to, to learn about all these other places in the world where you can actually ski for them is, you know, mind blowing. And then when you turn on, you know, Dan's little map here and you look at it and now my mind's blown about the places that, that he skied. Like this is my Utah, Africa. It, it, <laughs> it, it blows my mind that all this skiing and sailing, um, that Dan has been able to, um, experience in this world, um, has been, you know, it's great. I think it's, it's, it's pretty awesome when you have a vision of something you want to do with your life and places you want to go and, and, and things you want to experience. And, you know, Dan has made sure to, to do that. Um, you know, early on in my sports writing career, uh, someone, someone thought I was taking a bit of theirs or whatnot. It was, it was totally an innocent thing. Um, but they told me, good luck when you're, working a nine to five in a few years. And I, I took that insult, I'm like, what's wrong with a nine to five, first of all? Like, I, I, if I have a set schedule, that's fantastic. But I did take from that also the, the point of, you know, working for yourself and working for your dreams that you have and not really giving up to that. You know, I always wanted to be a journalist. I always wanted to be a sports journalist and it worked out for me. It worked out that I work, ended up working at the Boston Globe, where a place I wanted to work as a, as a, you know, growing up as a kid. Well, it worked out because New York Times ended up buying the Red Sox, and I was part of that package as part of Nesson at that point. Mm -hmm. And everything has a way of, you know, I'm not going to say if you can dream it, you can do it and go all Walt Disney on you. But there is a certain point of, you know, having a vision in your life and, making sure you take certain steps so that those things can, can happen. And, you know, that was part of the, um, the privilege of me telling Dan's story was there was, there's a lot of that in there, right? It's not so much, you can't do this and Dan's going to say, I'll show you, but it's more of, I'm going to do this because it's something different or it hasn't been done or, you know, it's going to tell quite a story. You know, and, and I speak of us as storytellers now, but Dan and John were telling stories 30 years ago in, in, in their original way. Um, so to be able to put those stories um, in print and to have everyone recollect, you know, what those adventures were like um, was, you know, for me, for, very fulfilling. The, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's amazing that, you know, Warren Miller really was the anchor for that for me, uh, the teach me storytelling and perseverance, Warren. If anybody out there hasn't seen the movie Ski Bum, it's worth watching the Warren Miller story and how Warren persevered in his own life to make his dream come true. Uh, and, and that really motivated me here to get this book, to get this book written. Um, you know, John and I skied in so many movies, uh, it's hard to pick you know, sort of our favorite uh, film, you know, there's just really favorite moments. I think jumping out of the tram for virtual reality, uh, vertical reality uh, in the 90s, that was a great moment. Um, of course, so many people remember the Cornish break. But of all the places we went around the world, um, Turkey was the most memorable place. You know, it was the friendliest place at a very strange time. Um, and, you know, it was really skiing in Cappadocia where the underground cities are, where the big sandstone spires and just the overall experience. And so much of those trips ha are, have to do with who you're with and, you know, who you're traveling with. And we just had a great crew there. And, you know, John and I went all around the world with Dean Dekas, the Greek, and, you know, he became like a brother for, for me and John and one of the greatest ski bums I've ever known, uh, and so many great cameramen. Uh, it, it's just so amazing. But uh, Eric, um, we it's about quarter to eight now. And uh, do you have uh, questions for me? Do I have questions for you? Yes. Um, where are your adventures taking you this year? Do you know yet? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm geared up, you know, we're really hoping that uh, Europe, you know, keeps keeps open and you know, we can get there. And 
you know, I've got a lot of trips planned for Europe, uh, Switzerland, uh, and, and of course, my springtime in, in France uh, for a month. So, you know, still, still hope, hoping yeah, everything goes smoothly. Uh, I've been talking a lot with uh, the European resorts and, and they're geared up for visitors. Uh, I've just got to follow the protocols. And of course, I'll be in Montana at Big Sky um, and bouncing around. So excited for the winter. Um, it's, it's really, of course, it's a new time for all of us, um, you know, with, with COVID and, and what's happening now, of course, is coming back. But uh, for me, you know, my spring uh, in Val d'Isere, France, uh, it's really just, I look forward to it. It's a great place to kind of settle in for me to end the season over there. Nice. And I guess I've never asked you this question. What was your favorite part of the writing process that we had? Well, I, I, you know, for me, my favorite part was, I don't know, it was one, like you said, it was emotion was very hard. Um, but I think the expansion, uh, you know, the process we had of, of, of how the chapters went back and forth between us uh, and how once I kind of realized that like, I can go into any paragraph and just blow it wide open and add emotion and add people and just kind of do that. I mean, that process for me was pretty cool. Uh, I was a little slow to really engage there at first, but then once we started doing it, you know, I really got involved and with that part of the process. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and, you know, but my favorite part, is when I hand the book to people and they're like, dude, 400 pages, nothing to say. Like, uh, and you know, between you and I, it's always funny because I'll be with Eric and I'll be like, dude, I forgot to tell this story. I wanted to tell this other story. And Eric will look at me and go, 400 pages, 400 pages. <laughs> yeah, as I was writing it and, and you know, I didn't really have a, a, a set for what, you know, I, I'm sitting there Googling how long are nonfiction books. Um, and then I get over the hundred thousand mark and it keeps going. And I was like, well, let's just, let's just see where it takes us. And, and it ended up being that, you know, a lot of it, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm told is that people love the, the length of the story. They love the, how compelling it is. Um, and that's great. You know, it, it's, it was, uh, it was a, like I've said it a million times, it was a treat to write one of the highlights of my, my journalism career, um, to be able to tell this story like this and, and to be it. Have it be uh, so warmly received is uh, it means a lot to me. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, so I guess we're uh, we're at a good time to throw it open to the audience. We've got some questions already kind of thrown in. Uh, Abby, if you want to lead us down that road, that'd be great. All right, I'm back. All right. Um... Okay, just a reminder that if you do have questions, I, I'm seeing some questions getting kind of muddled into the chat, which is hard to um, kind of sift through sometimes. So if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. It's easier to manage. Uh, one question. I am curious how Dan developed the skiing skills to do such extreme skiing. What was the progression to be able to ski such challenging terrain? Well, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, my mom's theory for raising us was to kick us out of the house. Just get outside uh, all day. Don't come back, you know, and uh, we lived on a hill. And when it snowed, we would ski all over that hill, down through the woods, down, jump, build jumps over the driveway, land in the neighbor's yards. And we did it on snurfers. We did it on sleds. We did it on skis. Um, so there was this idea of like, just go out and do it. It didn't matter about how icy it was or the conditions or the weather. Um, my older brothers are eight and six years older. Bobby's eight years older. John's six years older than me. So to keep up with them, you know, they, they wouldn't wait for a snotty nosed 10 year old. Um, and so I had to really learn some patience, uh, and, and really try and keep up. Um, you know, John and I used to hike up the mall at Sugarbush on, on Nordic skinny skis and Alpine down uh, in, in, you know, Nordic boots. Like we were into pushing our talent and pushing the envelope. Um, you know, we, his buddies at Sugarbush and, and, you know, who I wanted to hang out with, you know, they were always like, how fast and straight can you go through the moguls? 
how many times can you jump through the moguls? You know, John's advice to me was um, ski as fast as you can until you crash and then get up and do it again. So, you know, it was really trial and error and just balance that that was the progression. <laughs> so kind of on that same note, um, just growing up, you know, the fi family dynamic, your family life, growing up in the city, how how did that shape your career the rest of your life yeah you know one of the things we talk about in the book is that the two main uh things my parents instilled in us was confidence and independence um you know from the age of five i would leave the house on a summer day walk a quarter mile to the trolley take the trolley to the train to the red line take the red line into boston uh get on a bus and walk the final mile to south boston yacht club which is not like a you know, you know, sort of blue, you know, it's, it's a real working yacht club, rough neighborhood in the 70s. Uh, and I did that every day. Uh, and then I was sailing boats up and down through Boston Harbor solo, uh, really from the age of 10, 11 on and racing boats uh, all over. So that sort of adventure, you know, navigating the city, navigating the the train and the trolley and the neighborhood and the kids I would meet on the street corners, that that I think really shaped the way I, I saw the world. Um, and I, I, and I have a feeling John would say a similar thing. You know, uh, it affected us how we saw the world, uh, the places we could go. You know, my mom's instruction was be home for dinner. Um, and, and she meant it. And uh, so, you know, there was simple instruction go have fun, be home for dinner. And, you know, just managing all that, I think really did shape the way I saw the world. Great. Um, can you share a little bit more about your experience working with Warren Miller and how that kind of set you up for the rest of your career? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, he, he was rocket fuel for my life. You know, um, here's a guy who, you know, would drive, started making the movie, editing, shooting the movie, editing the movie, touring with the movie. Um, and when I first made my slideshow, I, I, I showed it to him and he really liked it. He goes, let's work on the narration. And he really helped me work on the narration. Warren told me he always wanted to make a movie out of all the film he threw away. So, I made my first film out of his outtakes um, and we worked on the narration um, and it got to the point where I was touring the major cities where his film was going to two weeks ahead of him. I'd go to the North Face, the REI store, the ski shop, the, the university, and I would promote the film coming two weeks and show my little film. And Warren loved that, that I was willing to get in the van and go. And, you know, I remember calling Warren up after a show and going, you know, he's like, how'd it go? I'm like, well, the, 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 the screen fell over in the middle of the show. Uh, there were two people in the audience. It was a disaster. And he's like, anybody buy a dinner? I'm like, well, actually, yeah, one guy did. He's like, you had a good night, dude. You had a good night. And, you know, that sort of attitude, like, what are you complaining about? You know, two people showed up to watch your film. That's amazing. Um, and so, you know, he really added a lot for that. You know, when we did Ski Bomb, uh, that was the last interview Warren gave uh, before he passed. And uh, he was witty and he was with it. And he had that same thing. You know, his really, you know, his parting words for me was keep going, keep doing it. Um, you know, for Warren, there was no limit. There was no stopping. Uh, just keep going. And, and that's, that's how he affected me. Do you have a favorite uh, Warren Miller film or top three? Um, well, I love, uh, there, there was a, you know, back then Warren was making two movies a year. He was making the feature film and then an additional video would go out uh, through TriStar. And there was a movie called uh, To the Extreme. Uh, it was Seven Skiers, Seven Continents. And I, my continent was South America. Got to ski Portillo with Kevin Andrews. And uh, I love that film. It was a great film. Um, like I said earlier, uh, you know, the Born to Ski 
was another great film that John and I did. Of course, Extreme Winter had the Cornish break in it. And Grand Targhee became our spiritual home, you know, after surviving the Cornish break. Uh, they really welcomed us in. We did our ex-team advanced ski clinics there for the next 15 years. Um, and uh, the last film, of course, was my favorite too. Jumping out of the tram was virtu uh, Vertical Reality. All right, another audience question. You always had an open mind about turning what you love into financial opportunities. Do you have any future media projects in mind? got a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm working on a couple of big projects right now. Uh, I'm doing a film uh, called Transforming the Beautiful Game. It's on racism in soccer. Um, it's the Clyde Best story. Clyde is known as the Jackie Robinson of the English Soccer Premier League. Um, and uh, we're telling Clyde's story. Um, and that's going to hopefully be out um, first quarter of 2023. Um, Eric and I have got our next project uh, underway. Uh, it's called Dying to Ski. It's about uh, all the lost skiers of the big mountain generation and all the friends that we've lost. Uh, we're tracking 30 professionals who have passed away, starting with Paul Ruff from Boston, Doug Coombs, of course, Shane McConkey. There's a big long list. Uh, but we're telling that story from the perspective of the survivors. Um, and we're wrestling with a bunch of questions in that story. That story will wrestle with a bunch of questions. One of them, uh, the main one is, you know, sport was meant to enhance our lives, not end it. Um, and, and also that idea that dying, doing what you love is a good death. You know, we ask that question, is it? And um, so it's a really fascinating project. I think it's an important project uh, to raise the awareness for people. Um, and it doesn't, judge or criticize any of the things that happened to our friends, but it does give a full picture of how it happened. I have a little side note on that. Um, you know, my, my son, one of my, one of my kids is an 11 year old boy. And uh, my mom told him that, you know, you should read your father's book. You could do it. It's, it's not that, that difficult for you to get through. And he said, nah, I'll wait for the next one. The next one sounds better. I'm dying to skate. So I don't know if that's a credit to you or a credit to, you know, the, the topic of the next one, but he'll wait for dying to ski before he d d jumps into white haze. All right. Well, we'll hold him to it. <laughs> Great. Another audience question. Um, what are some of your best sugar bush memories and how did you start your restaurant there? Oh, that's great. Well, I have so many sugar bush memories, you know, uh, John in 1976, John went to sugar bush. My mom forbid me to visit him. She said it was not age appropriate uh, for a, a 12 to 13 year old boy to go, go away to Sugarbush. I used to save up my uh, paper route money and, and uh, take a Greyhound bus up to see him. Uh, that was an eye opening experience. A uh, little side note on that my mom was right. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, those early days at Sugarbush, the passion I saw, you know, all of those. John's friends, all those ski bums, they all went on to be independent businessmen with great careers. Uh, they just went about it a little different, but they went about it with a lot of passion. But for me, you know, skiing Spillsville uh, is, you know, that, that's one of my favorite trails at Sugarbush. Um, and I have so many memories of just, you know, lapping Sugarbush. And of course, uh, Sugarbush North uh you know up up upper fis uh on a totally nasty icy day when people would only look down it and john and i would ski it like it was a powder run uh i i love that you know i i i really wish i still had that ability <laughs> to do it or that attitude to do it because you know as icy as it was man we we're on the vocal rent tiger and it felt like all grip, no slip skiing. And it was amazing. Um, but then of course, you know, the hiking in the woods, going over to Castle Rock from North um, and dropping in on a powder day, all those sorts of things. Uh, you know, Sugarbush is a special place and it's a special community. And I did not start the restaurant. That was John's restaurant, the big world. Uh, 
And uh, I think that came about through uh, through Bernie and Jerry. They all sat down together, the three of them, and launched that idea. That started in the old Mad Bush uh, hotel and bar, uh, motel and bar. And then they went to the Gallagher's building at the corner there. Um, and they had a great run. It was a beautiful place. Your book does a wonderful job telling Dan's story, including family history, which I loved, as did my brother. This is an audience member, not me. Uh, working and traveling with John must have been a dream. Do you think John might have a book in him, too? I imagine John got more than one book in him. What do you think, <laughs> Eric? Uh, last I talked to John, John had a title for his book all picked out, but the book has not been started yet, uh, to I've my read. knowledge. The, I imagine it would be amazing. And uh, I know John has told me he was going to tell the real story. So stand by. We'll see what happens. The ultimate teaser there. <laughs> <laughs> Long range. All right. How do you decide how far and how you can push the envelope in skiing or other sports as we maturely age out from being invincible youngins and have family and other responsibilities now? Yeah, that's a... Uh, so there's a syndrome called uh, immortality syndrome. Uh, it's, uh, it particularly hits young boys between the ages of 16 and 28. The only cure for immortality syndrome is near death, death, or marriage. And uh, and uh, you know that's a that's a tracked medical uh, definition right there. The um, I I've experienced that you know and. Um, I think what happens, you know, we change every decade, things change. Um, and I know that in my 40s, I was like, huh, something's happening. I don't know what. But I still feel like I can do it. I still want to do it. I was kind of pushing it hard. I would take my falls. It would bug me. My ego would be involved. I would want to go back up and do it. Um, jumping started to slip away from me. I, I would not jump really, unless it was a perfect day jump these days. Uh, I just don't, that gene went away. When I watch little Johnny, John's oldest boy, John Johnny ski, when he comes to ski with me at Big Sky or I hang with him at Bridger, he's like 22, 23 now. I see exactly what I don't have anymore. That reckless abandon, that balance, that, that punch it. So what I've done, you know, and in, in, in my 50s now, I, I just want to be in, in it. I want to go out and touch it. I want to experience it. I want to go out onto the slope. I, I want to be there. I don't have to ski it the same way as Johnny, little Johnny and his buddies, but my other, niece, my other nieces and nephews and friends. But I still want to be there. And, um, and I love that. You know, I love that I can still have the not only the ability but the availability and, the, and a lifestyle that still puts me out into avalanche terrain onto steep slopes uh early ups with the lifties and the, and the ski patrol like access uh it's a dream and uh i just ski it now with no expectations i'm not expecting to be the best one down i just expect to enjoy it probably more than everybody else perspective uh, what do you do to get in shape for ski season? Yeah, it's nonstop. You know, it's, it gets harder and harder. Um, but I'm a swimmer. I like to swim. I'm a cyclist. I love to ride my road bike. I don't do too much mountain biking. Um, I lift weights. Um, I I went from being a jogger to a plotter, um, but I still plod uh, as often as I can. And, um, you know, I think just, you know, a lifestyle that is active. Um, so I work out with a purpose um, and I, I work out with the intention that I'm, I'm getting ready. You know, I, I come out of the ski season always in the worst shape. That's just how it is. At the end of the year, I'm exhausted. Uh, I have to take a month to kind of regroup and coming into May, I start gearing it up. And this time of year, I'm, I'm gearing it up for the next notch. So it's an ongoing thing, but it's a mix for me uh, of, of running, swimming, cycling, lifting, and uh, you a lot of body weight and a lot of balance. Great. Can you tell us um, 
about your decision to stay in the East when so many skiers and riders tend to head out West? Yeah, I think they're lost souls. I think uh, I love the East. I'm, I'm a New Englander and uh, I've never wanted to live anywhere else. I, I've always went out to the West with the intention of coming home. Um, you know, my parents were here. Um, we've lost them both now, but um, you know, New England's my home. Uh, I, I like the West. I think it's great, but I've never understood this idea that it was better out there. It, it never seemed better to me. Um, I love the ocean. I'm a sailor. Um, and I love the lakes. So, you know, all that brings me back here. I, I cannot think of a better place on the planet than a New England summer. Um, this was a hot one, but, you know, normally they're just in a wet one, but normally they're perfect. And uh, as we head off into the fall now, the world comes to New England. So I'm a New Englander. All right. Well, that seems to be it for audience questions. If anybody has anything, they need to get it in there fast. Um, yeah. Otherwise, do you, Dan, or you, Eric, have anything? Oh, here's a question. I read your book, but how did it come about that you jumped out of the cannon tram? <laughs> it's a great story. Um, you know, the uh, Gary Nate had shot uh, skiers jumping out of the snowbird tram for Warren Miller. It was an iconic shot. Remember the first time I saw it sitting in the theater as a kid thinking, wow, that is cool. That's outrageous. Um, so when we came back here to do the film for Ski 93, we shot the movie at uh, Loon, Waterville, uh, Cannon and Bretton Woods. You know, it was so tempting to jump out of the tram. So we asked the question to the state of New Hampshire, could we jump out of the tram? And to much to my surprise, they were all about it. Um, they said that we had to start with the doors closed so that on the film you could read canon. So that meant the minute the doors opened, we had to go out because knowing the editors, they might cut it out. Um, so uh, we had to sort that out. We jumped out of, I think it's Tower 2. Um, it was before... They put in the trail under the tram. It was, we did it in the winter of 94. Uh, and the ski area blew snow under the tram for us. Um, and they blew this a big whale, just a big whale. Three days, they just blew snow. And then uh, Dean Dekas and I went up there and we sort of sculpted a landing out of it. Uh, we did not ski away from from uh, the tram jump. We did it twice. Allison Gannett also did it with us. She was a ski to pro skier and had grown up in New Hampshire, now, now settled in Crested Butte. Um, and uh, in hindsight, I'd do it a little different um, because uh, next time you ride up the red tram at Cannon, they call it the catch-up car. Uh, there's a metal ridge where the door runs. So this we had put snow in the in the tram, but we had to get up and over the ridge to get out. And uh, I don't know why it didn't occur to Dean or I to build a ramp in there. We could have easily built a ramp and had some momentum, but we started from a dead stop. So we had to go up on our poles and then push out to get away from that ridge. Because if you hit the ridge, you'd tip over. Um, but it was uh, just a, one of those stunts that we did. We had done a lot of stunts in the day during the, you know, in our career. Uh, John skied in a, a dial soap commercial where we had to carry a 35 millimeter camp, a big, huge film camera off a massive cliff in Telluride. Uh, we had skied into the back of the North Face van uh, as it pulled away. Uh, I jumped over the top of the quad restaurant at Bretton Woods. So jumping out of the tram seemed like a pretty normal thing to do. Um, and we did it twice pretty successfully. We just we didn't land on each other. That was good. But the story uh, of the shot was big because um, what happened was it became this event. So ESPN sent a crew, Fox Sports sent a crew, uh, and everybody was down below looking up at the tram. And the AP photographer and the Tommy Grissom, the Warren Miller photographer, could tell that that wasn't the angle. So they went up in the woods to get height so they could shoot across 
to get the shot that they got so they could see us against Eagles Cliffs across Franconia Notch. I was the director of Ski 93 at the time. So my office manager, Jan Kotak, she followed those guys up into the woods and she had a cardboard wind up camera. And she got the same frame of us coming out that the AP did. And that shot went all, all around the world, was on every major newspaper uh, in the country from Florida to Alaska. Uh, and Jan got the same shot on her roll on her cardboard click camera. It was so amazing. But uh, yeah, that's the tram piece. <laughs> uh, someone commented that they love these stunt stories. Do you have more? You mentioned, uh, you mentioned a couple of them. Well, the... Uh, do you? The, what, do I have <laughs> when we skied into the back of the 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 the, the van? Uh, we had my brother Ned, my younger brother was driving the van. Uh, we had built a ramp up into the van, and we came in way too hot. So as Ned is spinning away, John and I basically we came in so fast to that van, the tips hit the back of the driver's seats, and we clicked out. And just like pile drove ourselves into the front of the van, uh, but uh, that that was a whack wacky situation. Um, and you know, I think in general the stunts we did, you know, we had always sort of thought about what ifs. If what if we could do this? What if we could do that? Um, after we jumped out of the tram at Cannon, uh, Jay Peak asked us if we'd jump out of their tram, and we respectively declined. It's way too high. <laughs> <laughs> it says when you when you realize or you have limits there's boundaries <laughs> yeah all right that's funny the first time i i skied with dan um it was at park city in utah and my wife was very concerned about me getting ahead of myself and trying to keep up with dan and uh i just you know, said it's okay i'll handle it myself i'm okay uh, little did I know that part of Dan's skiing party that day was a friend of his who hadn't skied in, what, 15 years, 20 right. years? Yeah. And uh, so here's me and Dan Egan skiing together for the first time on the bunny slope, uh, which I thought was just perfect. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife appreciated that very much, that we skied uh, the bunny great. slope. Well, we sure uh, appreciate uh, the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum and everything that's happening up there and everything you do, Abby, for skiing and, and keeping the heritage of Vermont skiing going. I think, of course, Stowe is really the best town for that heritage. There's so much rich history there, uh, Mount Mansfield. Um, and, you know, we're just so excited about the book. Thanks for supporting it. We will have an ebook out shortly, later this month. Uh, we'll, go, we'll get to Audible eventually. No, I'm not going to read the whole book, just the intro. Um, but uh, it was a great experience. And I, I just, you know, really, I can't thank Eric Wilbur uh, uh, enough. You know, Eric, you know, brought together the, uh, the editorial arc and the expertise that we needed to write the book that was written. Uh, and it was, Eric, I learned so much from you. Every chapter starts like the best Boston Globe story you can imagine and uh, they all have a great opening and 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 it's so amazing people will read the book and they'll ask me a question halfway through and I'll go turn the page just turn the page Eric planted that answer a couple of paragraphs away so just stick with it well thank you I mean it, I think we had a shared vision of the book which was so easy to do because um, you know I've heard stories of people writing someone's biography and it's 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 a tug of war sometimes because the writer wants to get out what's good for the the product and the story whereas the the person whose life it is doesn't want that in the book and so to be able to work with someone like dan who is you know more than willing to to put that sort of stuff out there was was just great so uh thank you to you thank you to the vermont you know, ski museum. I, I stop in all the time when I'm in Stowe. I think it's a it's a, a great little stop. Uh, looking forward to being there next weekend and, and, and taking another world around. Um, this was a great time. I'm honored to be a part of it. And uh, if you haven't read the book yet, I, I encourage you to do so because um, let me know what you think. I liked it. Thanks so much. 
Awesome. Yeah. And as Eric hinted at, they um, do have a book signing down the street from us at Bear Pond Books next Saturday, right? Next Saturday. Next Saturday. Um, and we will be open next Saturday, noon to five. So if you go visit the bookstore or you can come visit our little bookstore, um, but come visit us. I see a lot of familiar names um, in the audience, but I also see a lot of new ones. So if you're in the area, want to take a road trip or live around here and haven't been in, please definitely stop by. Um, but yeah, this was wonderful. So thank you so much, Dan and Eric, um, for joining us tonight and for launching this new Red Bench season for us. It is, uh, gosh, it feels so good to be back. I really love doing these events. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us tonight. Don't forget to make those donations and a new pair of uh, darn tough socks could be all yours. Uh, we have some exciting things on the horizon at the museum. We'll be hosting our second uh, autumn online auction next month. More information will be coming on that. We have a new exhibit opening after Thanksgiving. And of course, we've just launched the Red Bench series. So we'll bring you a new discussion each month um, for the rest of the ski season. So follow us on social media, join our email list to stay up to date on those happenings. Um, and as always, this event was recorded. So we'll have this up on our YouTube channel next week. Um, if maybe you joined late or had to leave early or you have friends that might enjoy this or you just wanna rewatch it, it will be on there. And as I said, we have signed copies of the book um, available in our gift shop in person or in our online shop, which the link to that is in the beginning of the chat. Um, and I just want to mention, you know, there's the chat kind of reads as, as some great reviews for this book. Um, it clearly is a must read and everybody agrees. Um, so if you haven't read it, get your hands on it, and give it a read. Um, and that is, that's it for tonight. Thank you all so, so much for tuning in. Um, have a good night. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Ciao.